So we were talking about morphisms. So the uh, last thing we had shown that um, if we look at this map, uh, so phi i from u i to e n, so which is the, <coughs> the usual map that uh, sends uh, the point a0 to a n. So here we have a i, a n, and a i is not 0 because we have u i um, sends this to a0 divided by a i until this one we leave out. That this map is a morphism, is an isomorphism. This was, uh, you know, <coughs> we know that morphisms to a n are given by uh, n tuples of regular functions. And so um, we proved it that way. Now we want to um, give some simple, some applications. So, I mean, just some facts. So first, every variety is isomorphic to a quasi-projective variety. So here, I mean, I mean, sometimes I had said that a quasi-projective variety is uh, just anything, uh, you know, that we can say that uh, uh, that we sometimes say that uh, uh, even if we have uh, something which is locally closed in an, it can be viewed as those locally closed in pn and uh, so on. But here we don't. Here we really mean that uh, a quasi-projective variety is a locally closed subset of some projective space. And uh, the other statement is that uh, every variety has an open cover by affine varieties. But I recall that an affine variety is a variety which is isomorphic to a closed subset of some AN. So, um, as I said, this statement is quite useful for theoretical purposes because it means one can prove things that are facts which are local on a variety by just proving it on fine varieties. And this is quite uh, useful. Also, there is the concept of an abstract variety which we do not consider, which is somehow motivated by this. So an abstract variety will be a variety which uh, will be some space, which in a suitable sense has an open cover by affine varieties. Okay, so uh, the generalization goes this way. And if one goes to the uh, general, the modern uh, algebraic geometry, one has a notion of schemes, which are more abstract and more complicated. and. Um, you have a notion of an affine scheme, which is a generalization of an affine variety. And then a scheme is something which has an open cover by a fine scheme. So it's, again, a generalization of this. OK. So this is how over here things are quite simple. So <clears throat> OK. So if, um, so, so let x be a variety. So if uh, X is a locally closed subvariety in some projective space, then by definition it's quasi-projective, so there's nothing to show. So we can assume, so assume X is locally closed subvariety in AN. So, so we can put um, 
let's say you put y to be so uh, phi zero to the minus one of x, which is now so phi zero is the uh, map from uh, u zero to n, so which is um, uh, which is p n is locally closed. Because we know that um, phi zero is an, uh, an isomorph isomorphism, in particular, it's a homomorphism, and so um, we therefore know that uh, X is, and it's also locally closed subvariety. of Pn uh, because it's, um, so it's irreducible because uh, x is irreducible and phi is an isomorphism and so it's a homeomorphism and uh, being uh, irreducible is a topological property. No, it's, that is not the union of two uh, closed subsets uh, unless one of them is equal to it. So <clears throat> this is a locally closed subvariety and obviously is an isomorphism. OK, so this is basically a triviality. And um, so the second one is not much more difficult. So, <clears throat> so we have here a, a local statement. Which, so every variety has an open cover by a fine variety. So, um, so if x is quasi-projective, we have that uh, we can write x equal to the union i equals 0 to n of x intersected ui. And um, x intersected ui is locally closed subvariety in, or at least is isomorphic in AN. So if X is a variety, it's either quasi-projective or it's a locally closed subvariety in AN, and it has an open cover by things which are isomorphic to locally closed subvarieties in AN. So uh, as we have here a local statement, we have to just show uh, it is enough to check it in case X is a locally closed subvariety in AN. So we can assume. OK, so what do we have to show? We have to show it has an open cover by a fine variety, by a fine uh, variety. So it's equivalent to say that every point on X has a neighborhood which is an, has an open neighborhood which is in a fine variety. That's the same statement, only said in a different way. So equivalent every point for every point in X, there exists an open neighborhood U times an X, which contains P such that U is a fine. And define meets isomorphic to closed subset in some AN, in this case in AN. Well, so we have, assu we have assumed that X is a locally closed subvariety in AN, so we can write maybe X equal to. Uh, say y without z, where y 
and Z are closed sub varieties or closed subsets in um, N. And uh, now we have to take any point and find the neighborhood. So let P a point in X. So then uh, there exists a polynomial in Kx1 to Xn which does not vanish at P. Maybe, I mean, a non zero polynomial, a non constant polynomial, such that um, with uh, f of p is different from zero. You can always find that non polynomial which doesn't vanish at a given point. So then, let me see, however. Ah, yeah, I made a mistake, uh, or I mean, I was a bit too fast. <coughs> I mean, that's also true, but that's not what I want. So what I want is that there exists an F in um, the ideal of Z um, with F of P different from zero. This is, you know, this is because P does not lie in Z. No, it lies in X, which is Y without Z. So then, you know, the <clears throat> and this is a closed, Z is a closed subset. So uh, the zero set of the ideal of Z is Z. So, you know, it's clear that this is the case. So now we put, take XF. And remember what XF is. This is the set of all points P, or maybe now they're called Q in X, such that F of Q is different from zero, is an open subset in X. And we see, or I can put, I actually put YF. So you see, this is an open subset in Y. And we know that YF is affine because we proved that we have a, uh, an affine algebraic set. We take this thing. <coughs> and it contains P. contains P and uh, it also <coughs> is, uh, and we see also that YF is contained in X because, um, you know, we take away, so F is in the ideal of Z. So the zero set, uh, if we, so Z is uh, contained in the set which we take away when uh, when we make YF. So thus, YF is an affine open neighborhood. Of P. OK, so that was simple. But as I said, it is sometimes quite useful. So now. We want to describe uh, morphisms between quasi-projective varieties, again, coordinate-wise, in a very similar way as we did with affine varieties. So that, uh, you know, it's something that uh, your coordinates are locally given by polynomials or something like that. And so let's uh, do this. <coughs> Because, uh, as I said, the definition 
Morphism is a bit abstract and uh, useful for theoretical purposes, but usually not for studying examples. So theorem. So let uh, x in Pm, y in Pn be quasi projective varieties. And uh, let um, phi from x to y be a map. So then the following are equivalent. First, phi is a morphism. Second, um, P is given locally by uh, regular functions. So by this I mean the following. Um, so for all points P and X, there exists an open neighborhood. U in X, which contains P, uh, and for and um, um, regular functions H zero until H n, you know the number of coordinates here is n, which are regular on the whole of U. Uh, with no common zeros on u. No, you know, a point in projective, well, we'll see in a moment, <coughs> such that phi of q is equal to uh, h0 of q until h n of q for all q and u. So I can also write phi is equal to h0 hn on u. OK, so this is the first statement. The other. And you can see that we need that it has that we have no common zeros because otherwise this would not be a well-defined point in projective space. And the other statement is uh, for is with polynomials, so it's locally a polynomial function. So, A polynomial map. So by this I mean uh, a similar statement. So for all points P and X, there exists an open neighborhood U in X and uh, polynomials. So maybe I call them. F0 to so Fn in the variables on the space we start with, which are homogeneous of the same degree. And as before, with no common zeros on u. Um, such that, you know, the map is given in the same way. So phi of q is equal to f 
at zero of q until n of q for all q in u. So I can again write phi is equal to f zero of f. Okay, so this is a rather similar to the affine case, and it's also rather simple. So we will prove it by reducing it to the statement in the affine case. Now we have proven, uh, and for this we use the result we just proved, that we have that this open subset u0 is isomorphic, or ui is isomorphic to an. OK. So I mean, <clears throat> so if phi is a morphism, then it's also a morphism as a morphism to Pn. So I can just look, look at that case. So if um, phi from x to Pn is a morphism, oh. and p a point in x, um, well, then it will be true. You know that pn is covered by this open subsets ui. So the point p will map to one of the uis. Maybe to more than one, but will map to one. So there exists an i such that p of p is in ui. And for simplicity of notation, I assume that it maps to u0. I mean, otherwise you can manage with indices. So assume uh, p of p is in u0. OK. So let u be a neighborhood, open neighborhood of p such that, so p in x, such that uh, phi of u is contained in u0. For instance, I could just take the inverse image of u0 under phi. So then, obviously, if we take this map phi 0, you know, phi 0 was this map from u0 to n, this isomorphism, and compose it with phi from u to n, is a morphism. So, um, so by what we know is we can write it as an n-tuple of regular functions. No, regular functions, regular on the whole of you. We had this result, how morphisms to a n go. So in order to get back phi, we have to compose with the inverse of phi 0, which uh, after all was the map, which took an n-tuple like this and added 1 to it at the beginning. Okay, So then we have phi is equal to u0 composed with phi 0 composed with phi. And this is therefore equal to 1, h0, h1, no? For every point q, we do this. And so we see these are, 1 is obviously a regular function on the whole of u. It's regular everywhere. And um, these are regular functions. So the map is given by an n plus 1 tuple of regular functions. So. This proves this statement. 
Now, um, from two to three. So assume our map is given by an n of regular function. So assume p is equal to h0 to hn. I mean, on u. So we have an open cover so that for every point p, there exists an open neighborhood such that, and so on. Um, OK, and the hi are regular with no common zeros. On you. Um, well, we can make, you know, we are supposed to just find for every point P and X an open neighborhood. So we can where something is true. So we can always make uh, our open subset smaller. And we can increase it by, and if by making it smaller, we can assume that these regular functions are again the quotients of homogeneous polynomials of the same degree. So. Uh, possibly smaller. can assume that hi is equal to fi divided by gi with the fi and gi in k x0 to xn homogeneous of the same degree. I, I'm not saying that for all i the fi's and the gi's have the same degree. I just mean if I fix i, then fi and gi have the same degree. And uh, gi non-zero, gi without zeros. On u. We have done this many times. Now I want to uh, uh, prove this statement. So I just have to clear the denominators. So write uh, that um, for all i, let uh, say l i equal to what? I take, um, I think, f i times g0 times g1 until uh, I leave out g i until Gn. Okay. So then um, the Fi and the Li are homogeneous, all of the same degree. It's the same as the degree of the product of all the gi, because the, the gi has the same degree as ever. OK, and um, <clears throat> I claim they have no common zeros on u. That maybe you can check. And um, we see, by definition, We have that uh, phi on, on u, phi is equal to h0 to hn, where we have this. And now we just multiply the whole thing with the product of the gi's. Which then we get l0 ln. No? You know, because after all, 
multiplying by a, if we do this for any p, p we multiply with the value of a, uh, the product of the gi on the coordinates. And this is just the same constant for all of them. And it's fine. And we, we know that the gi don't have zeros on u. So we can multiply with this without uh, the li getting a common zero. And so this is the statement. And now finally, we have to prove that if we are given a map by polynomials in this way locally, then it actually is a morphism. So this is an uh, to one. So, <clears throat> you know, now, to be a morphism is a local thing. If I have a map, that it's a morphism is something you have to check just locally. If you have an open cover of the source, and each open subset of the cover is it's a morphism, it is a morphism. So, so uh, let uh, phi, assume phi restricted to u, can be written as, say, h0 hn for some polynomials as before homogeneous of the same degree and with no common zeros then the only thing we have to show is that Phi restricted to U is actually a morphism. That's um, so we can uh, by making u possibly smaller again we have to only find an open cover we can assume that instead of uh, these things have, having no common zero, one of them actually has no zero on u. Because you know the set of common zeros is the intersection. So we can just take away the zero set to get a smaller open subset. Can assume uh, one of the hi. So and I will just assume, say, h0 has no common has no zero. Because obviously, u is the union of the sets where one of them is non zero. That's the statement. Uh, okay. So then we can put hi, then so for i equals. 1 to n, we put hi equal to h large hi by h0, which is a regular function on u. Because it's a quotient of homogeneous polynomials of the same degree. Well, so in some sense, we just retrace the steps. So we therefore have that phi. In other words, phi is of the form 1 h1 to hn. But that means if we take phi 0 composed with phi, this is uh, done by dividing everything by that. This is the map. H1 
for each n like this. And this is a morphism because it's given by polynomials. But S phi 0 is an isomorphism. If uh, something is a morphism, and I after I composed with an isomorphism, it was a morphism to begin with because I can compose with U0. OK. I mean, to begin, in principle, we are still on U. So phi is equal to U. It's a morphism, and therefore phi is a morphism. So, okay. So this is some. So we have this concrete description. I mean, which is, at least you can somehow write down, coordinate-wise, what morphisms are. It's not so super practical because you only have this open cover substat, so you can only do it locally. I mean, <clears throat> so, but still, we have a concrete way of saying it. So, just maybe a couple of examples. Well, I don't know. We want this um, so one um, so I will give a couple of examples where actually the morphism is given just by an n tuple of polynomials not uh, you don't need to define it locally but there are also many where you need so um, so the first one is very simple These are the projective transformations Just if uh, we have a matrix, A0, 0 to A0, N, A, N, 0 to A, N, N. So this is an, uh, N times 1, N plus 1 times N plus 1 matrix with coefficients in K. Then we, then this defines us a way, a, a morphism of Pn to itself in the obvious way. So let A from Pn to Pn. I associate to a vector, uh, say, B0 to Pn. I you know, associate to it this matrix applied to this vector. So I mean, strictly speaking, uh, you know, as a column vector like that. So uh, I just maybe write it out like this. As a apply this matrix to the vector. And um, well, this would now set it on the basis of vectors, but here I associate to the thing in projective space the corresponding vector in projective space. So, so this is called a projective transformation. sometimes also projective change of coordinates. And we can see this is a morphism. Why is that? Well, we can write it down in coordinates. Because what do we see? Um, in, you know, in coordinates, it is just given by linear polynomials. We have, for instance, the first component of the image is A0, 0, B0 plus uh, A0, 1, B1, and so on. 
And so this just means uh, that we just have A0, zero, zero, X0 zero plus A01, zero X1 No, that's just what it means. No, this is the map which is so. This is the polynomial which is associates to B zero to B n, uh, a zero zero B zero, and so on. So this gives us the first line, and then it goes on, just applying in the same way the coordinates, and uh, this is a n zero, x zero, plus. So this thing is given by an n tuple, an n plus one tuple of polynomials of degree one. So it's a morphism. And in fact, it's an isomorphism. Because obviously, if we do it with the inverse matrix, we get the inverse map. So if we take the inverse of this morphism is the morphism given. Ah, yeah. You see, I forgot to say it, no? But this is not necessarily a morphism because if we have, if this has a kernel, then this will map to zero. Uh, so all the co coordinates would be zero in the image and would not be well defined. So we have to have an invertible matrix. You know, if the map is not invertible, this will not give us a well defined morphism. But once it is invertible, it obviously gives us an isomorphism because we can take the inverse matrix to define the inverse map. Okay. Okay, so you know, obviously, I mean, this is not so exciting, but it is, uh, you know, one very often, these are somehow, if you want the most trivial morphisms, which don't do anything at all, you know, you just, in some sense, you really change only the coordinates on Pn. You know, it's just, if you put another system of coordinates on Pn, you, you know, you would, uh, that's more or less what amounts to. But what is actually a fact, but is actually not so easy to prove, is that all isomorphisms of Pn to itself are of this form. And at any rate, very often you want to classify things only, I mean to understand things only up to isomorphism or up to isomorphism of the ambient projective space. So somehow we often just uh, ignore uh, projective transformations. What? Yeah, I think it's not so easy to prove, yeah. I mean, uh, the question is how, you know, we, we don't really have a reasonable criterion how to show that something is not a morphism. Okay. And so it's, um, yeah, I, I'm not, I don't think I know how, with the things that we have discussed so far, I don't know how to prove it. I mean, one needs slightly more advanced techniques, I think. I mean, I haven't tried very hard, but I think it uh, is a bit more. So another uh, thing that one often considers are projections. Uh, so this is, uh, so say that when X to N is a subvariety and uh, W in to N is another subvariety. 
no, actually a projective uh, linear to a projective subspace of Pn. So by this I mean that, uh, you know, <coughs> you have uh, some linear subspace of a n plus 1, of k n plus 1, and you just look to at the points in projective space which correspond to that, of the image in projective space, of some dimension. Then we can project from it, 200 k. Yeah. So and we assume uh, x does not intersect W. Then we can project from W. So what does it, so in particular, so if we have such a linear subspace, it has dimension K, so it has co-dimension uh, N minus K, so it can be taken as a zero set of uh, N minus K linear forms. Of, uh, for, of n minus k polynomials of degree one. It's just you know a subspace of a linear subspace of dimension of, of co-dimension n minus k is intersection of uh, n minus k hyperplanes. Um, so there exists um, uh, n minus k linear forms. So homogeneous polynomials of degree one, H zero, so H n minus k plus minus one, such that um, W is a zero set of that. And now the projection from W is the map given by these linear forms. So call the projection from U is, uh, say, PW from X to PN minus K minus 1 which is just given as uh, H0, Hn minus k minus 1. So for every point P, we just associate this. And uh, <coughs> this I claim is a morphism. Um, so it's given by uh, polynomials homogeneous of degree one, so that's fine. So they should have no common zero on X, but that's also fine because the common zeros of these is, you know, W. So the HI have no common zeros. On X, because uh, W intersected X is empty. So this is uh, a well-defined morphism. Well, in some sense, it's not completely well-defined. I call it here the projection from W. But the way I've defined it, it doesn't just depend on W. It also depends on the choice of these. Okay. So if... Um, so PW depends on H0, Hn minus K is 1, and not just on W. But uh, if, um, say, we have another set of such forms, L0 to Ln minus K minus 1, then you can see, you know, the, then you have, these are just two bases of the same vector space, namely of the vector space of, uh, you know, corresponding dual vector space. Uh, and so there will be a matrix which uh, you know, transforms one basis into the other. 
And so this means uh, uh, then uh, there exists a linear a projective transformation. A from uh, Pn minus k minus 1 to Pn minus k minus 1, such that it you know, comp makes one into the other. So such that, say, h0 to hn minus k minus 1 is equal to a composed with L0 to Ln minus k minus 1. So we see that the projection from a linear subspace is well defined up to a projective transformation in the target. So if we somehow view them as something where nothing really happens, it's just the choice of basis, uh, then they are kind of well defined. Um, and I mean the most uh, Useful case is the projection from a point. So if um, P so in particular we can so in particular if P is a, a point in Pn which does not lie in X, we have uh, phi P from X to P uh, N minus 1. So for instance, I mean, again, well defined after projective transformation of N minus 1. For instance, if P is the point x0, uh, so say, which one did I want? So 0, 0, 1 in Pn. Then we see that, you know, we can just take the coordinate functions to define it. So we have pi p. So one way to write pi p would be uh, x0 And maybe I should say some words about uh, projection. You can always view it like that also in this case, but I will not uh, uh, detail that, that you have this, uh, you know, have x in this projective space. You somehow take a projective space of, I mean, a complementary projective space, which doesn't intersect this one, and you make some projection to it. So by, <coughs> in a linear way, so let me, so we can look at it in this case, where it's a bit simpler. Um, so for instance, we, if we identify Pn minus 1 with uh, the, a hyperplane, just a zero set of xn in Pn in the obvious way. So a0 to an minus 1 uh, is identified with uh, or is mapped to a0 to an minus 1, 0. Then we find that uh, if I define PP, PP like this, pi P of a point PQ will be equal to the intersection point of the line through the points P and Q. Uh, with this hyperplane. So 
you can somehow, so this is what you usually call projection. You know, you have a, so that the picture is really like a projection. So you have here your given point P. Here you have the point Q. And here somehow is this uh, Pn minus 1, which is actually just a zero set of Xn. And what you do is you just take the line through P and Q, and it will intersect this thing in one point, and that's the, the image point. OK, so that's just one example. <clears throat> uh, later, we'll, you know, anyway, so now for the moment, that is as much as I wanted to say about this. Now we want to look at something which is in some sense uh, simpler, but then turns out to be in the end, not so much simpler, which is products of uh, varieties. So, um, so <clears throat> so it's just uh, the obvious thing if X and Y are two varieties. You want to consider the product x times y, and you want to be this to be a variety and whatever. Um, and uh, why would one want to study such a thing? So one thing that one wants to use it to study is again to study morphisms, because uh, you can describe a morphism by its graph, which is a subset of the product, and this is sometimes useful, I mean, to, a useful way to, to study morphisms. You can say things about morphisms sometimes nicer by talking about the formula, something about the graph, or you find it useful to prove things that way. And uh, we will actually prove two, I mean, introduce two important notions uh, using these products, which are separatedness and, um, and completeness, which, um, you know, you know that um, with our Zariski topology, spaces are not Hausdorff, therefore they are not really compact. I mean, they will always, but um, we want somehow some replacement for the Hausdorff property and for the compactness. And um, so the, the, what we, the thing that we will call separatedness will replace the, uh, uh, the Hausdorff property. It will somehow say that morphisms uh, from varieties behave as if they actually were morphisms between Hausdorff spaces, uh, between, were continuous maps between Hausdorff spaces, even though they are not. And uh, um, one has then completeness, which is replaces compactness. And so again, we prove some theorem that morphisms between Projective varieties behave as if they were, you know, Hausdorff compact spaces and uh, mo uh, continuous maps between them. Although, again, this is not true, but uh, this is anyway <coughs> uh, what we will use it for. And this will require to look at the products in a somewhat careful way. So, um, now I will start with the easy case, which is the product of affine varieties, because it's easy to see what the product of an affine variety should be. Uh, then uh, next time we will deal with the product of projective varieties, and the problem is that if you take x in Pn and y in Pm, then you know there is no projective space in which the product lives in a natural way. So you have to somehow deal with that. Okay. Okay, so let's start with products of affine varieties. And that's actually simple, and you even had an exercise where you have kind of solved this problem for us in some way, at least uh, in part. <coughs> so 
So, so this is uh, you know this is easy. So if um, if x in uh, an and y in am are uh, say closed sub varieties. Well, then as a product, we take the product, no? And x times y is the product of the two, which is just a n plus m. And we will see that this is, again, a closed sub variety. So let's do it. Um, So let's do it right properly. So let um, x in n, y in m be closed sub varieties um, the product. of x and y is just the product. I mean, it's a bit crazy. So the set of all pq in uh, a n times a m, which are just, which is the same as a n plus m, such that p is in x and q is in y. Okay, so that's rather obvious. And now the point is that this is also a closed sub variety. First, we can easily see it's a closed subset. So if um, x is a zero set of some polynomials, f1 to fn, uh, maybe I should say, as usual, so I denote, so let um, the x0, x1 to xn be the coordinates on a n on the first factor, y1 to ym the coordinates on the second factor, a m. And then we take x1 to xn and y1 to m as the coordinates on product. And uh, so. <coughs> If x is closed, it's given we can write uh, x equal to the zero set of, say, f1 to fk for some finite number polynomials f1 to fk, where fi are polynomials in x1 to xn, and y as a zero set of some other polynomials, g1 to gl, in the other variables. And then x times y is just a common zero set of these in uh, an plus m. So x times y. This is uh, clear from the definition because what does this mean? So uh, the fi only have the first coordinates. So if I take a, uh, take a point in an plus m as a pair pq, where p is in an and q is in m, then the first condition say that the point p is in x. And the second condition says that the q point q is in y. And so this is the set of all points in the n plus m, where one component lies in x, the other one in y. So we then can see, so this is a closed subset. It's a bit more difficult to see. We want to see also that the product of varieties is a variety, so irreducible. So that is a bit more tricky. 
and we have to take a, some effort. We will prove it slightly more general way so that we later can use it also for projective uh, varieties. So we uh, prove the following lemma, which is general statement about topological spaces. So let X and Y be irreducible topological spaces. Now, <clears throat> we want to make one assumption about the topology being somehow just a little bit reasonable. So assume, uh, so it's not, you, you see, it's not quite clear what kind of topology we will have on the product. No? So, um, I mean, here we will have the Zariski topology on the product, but now here we have a general statement. So assume we have a, a topology on the product is uh, such that uh, the following maps are continuous. So if I take, say, JP from Y to X times Y, which sends any point Q in Y to the pair PQ. So just, you know, you have the product X times Y, and you just... Um, you know, fix a point P here and you just map every point in Y to corresponding fiber in that direction. And the other way around also, so, uh, so this is for all P. So it's continuous for all P in X and also the other way around, map IQ from X so x times y, which sends p to pq, is also continuous for all q in y. So if I just embed this as a Feynman direction, it should be continuous, which you know one would assume that uh, most topologies one can imagine on the product will have this property. then the product is irreducible. Okay. So if the both factors are irreducible and we have this property that these embeddings are, are continuous, then the product will be irreducible. So let's see how one proves this. It's a bit of a trick. So we, uh, we have an indirect proof. So we uh, assume that uh, it is reducible. So assume x times y is equal to S1 union S2, where the Si are closed. In other words, uh, we this then show that uh, would then give that x is reducible. So then we have to see that um, um, <clears throat> and we uh, I think we also assume that y is irreducible and we will want to show that x is is also reducible, not irreducible. So we define one, two, not so many. We put take Ti to be uh, so intersection of all Q in Y EQ to the minus one of Si. So where EQ 
was this map. So in other words, this is the set of all points P and X such that if I take PQ, this is an SI for all Q in Y. Okay, so if um, somehow, yeah, if somehow this would be S1, no? Uh, then we see that uh, T1 would be somehow the set of all things where the whole, uh, all the fiber lies in it. Okay. So we know that the map GP is continuous. Now that we had assumed for all P and uh, Y is irreducible. Thus it follows that the image of JP is also irreducible. So JP of Y, which is just P times Y is irreducible. I mean, with the topology that we have on x times y. Because we know if you have the image on a continuous map of something irreducible, it's irreducible. So it follows that JP, that this thing must either be contained in S1 or in S2. Because otherwise, uh, we could write it as a union of two closed subsets in an intersection. So it follows that P times Y is contained in S1 or P times 1 is contained in S2. But what does it mean? It means for every point P, um, we have that P times Y is either contained in S1. So I could also, you know, to rewrite this, I can also have the set of all P and X. So I take this division such that P times Y is contained in SI. No? This is equivalent. So this means, and this is true for all P. So for all P and X, it's either in S1 and S2. So it means that X is the union of T1 and T2. And um, on the other hand, I didn't say it, the TI, so this, you know, the IQ is continuous. Okay. Therefore, the inverse image of SI by IQ is closed. And TI is, a, is an intersection of closed subset. So thus it follows that TI is closed. So it follows that X is a union of T1 and T2. And uh, these are closed subsets. And obviously, neither T1 nor T2 is equal to x because otherwise uh, the corresponding si would be equal to x times y. Thus it follows that x is reducible. And so we have proven our statement. Um, so we can uh, so we can apply this to our this general statement now to our concrete product of uh, uh, a fine 
to an enclosed subset of fine space. So we assume still that, um, so this is the corollary. We assume that again x in the n and y in the m are sub varieties, uh, closed sub varieties, but actually would also work otherwise. Uh, then it follows that uh, x times y is also closed sub variety. So we want to apply the lemma. And so, you know, x and y are irreducible, so we have to check these two these statements that these uh, obvious maps of inclusion of the factors into the product are continuous. But that's very easy. So if I take a point, so, so only to check, let's say for uh, Q in Y, we have that IQ from X to X times Y is continuous. Obviously, we also have to prove it for uh, JP, but uh, you know we can imagine that the proof will be the same. So, <clears throat> okay, so let's do it. What is it? So, I mean, note that so we write write Q equal to uh, say B one to Em, yeah, no, it's a point in y. Then iq is just the map x1 to xn, b1 to bm. It's just the map that you know, taking you know, taking a, a, an n-tuple of points in an and sending it to this n plus m tuple you know, where these are just fixed numbers. You know, and this certainly is continuous because coordinate wise it's given by regular functions. These are constant, they're certainly regular and these are you know, just polynomials, they're also regular. So isomorphism. It's a morphism and therefore it's continuous. So it's very simple. <coughs> so this proves, uh, and then we apply the lemma. I mean, obviously the same you would have to do, as I said, for JP, but that is the same statement. I mean, the same proof. Okay. So finally, I want to show you the universal property of the product. Position. Universal property. So it's some kind of property about maps to the product which defines, uh, somehow determines the product up to isomorphism. And it's uh, somehow very often when one uses the product for something one will actually only use this universal property. So let's see what it is. The first statement is the projections um, E1. See, so we assume again just to know that X is in AN and Y in AM are closed sub varieties. And we have again x1 to xn the coordinates on an and y1 to y m the coordinates on am. So p1 
which I can just write x1 to xn from x times y to x is a morphism. And the same for the second projection. So it's just, uh, and as you can see, this is uh, obvious because I've written it down. I mean, I have given, given you uh, the coordinates of the map. They are obviously polynomials. And uh, so this is a morphism, so this is okay. And uh, the second statement is, is the actual universal property. So let that be any variety. So the morphisms uh, from z to x times y are precisely the following. the maps which I could write f g from z to x times y which sends uh, any point p in z to f of p g of p for uh, f from z to x and g from z to y morphisms. So I'm saying that I have told you in some way what all the morphisms to the product are. They are given, uh, to give a morphism to the product of x and y is the same as giving a product, uh, a morphism to x and a, a morphism to y. And the morphisms to the product are just given by, you know, using uh, the first morphism as a map in the first, com first direction, the other morphism as a map in the other direction. Okay? So, I mean, one can also, yeah. <clears throat> you know, you, could al you can also say it differently if you want. You can say a map, so equivalently, from z to x times y is a morphism. So this is if and only if um, p1 composed with c and p2 composed with c are morphisms. It's the same statement, you know, because p1 composed with c is f and p2 composed with c is g. So let's prove it. So one was obvious, now two. It's also not very difficult. So in some sense, I, so if um, H from Z to X times Y is a morphism, so maybe Then if I, comp and we know that P1 and P2 are morphisms, then it follows that the composition with P1 and 2 are morphisms. Why do I call it H? Um, then um, we have that F, which I define to be P1 composed uh, with P, and G, which I define as P2 composed with P, are morphisms as compositions of morphisms. And we see that uh, uh, phi is equal to fg, you know, because it's just a map which sends uh, a point to uh, you know, the fact that uh, if I compose it with uh, p1, I get f, and with p2, I get phi, just says that you know, the map is like this. Okay, so conversely, uh, 
assume I have, you know, F and G morphisms. Then, you know, recall that X and Y are uh, a fine variety, actually sub-varieties of a fine space. So, um, the, such a morphism will be given by a tuple of regular functions. So, so then, there exist. Um, F1 to Fn in uh, OZ of Z, so regular functions on the whole of Z, and uh, G1 to Gm in OZ of Z such that F is just F1 to Fn and G is just G1 to Gm. Well, then it's not very difficult to see how we can write uh, our uh, F comma G in terms of regular functions. So then So this is now given by an n plus m tuple of regular functions, therefore it's a morphism. Okay. Okay, so that was um, maybe all I wanted to say for today. So next, so this, as you see in the case of the fine varieties, the product is a rather straightforward thing. You just take the product and the obvious things work. Um, now we will see that projective for projective spaces, uh, for sub-varieties of projective space, it's a bit more complicated because, as I said in the beginning, that if you have, a, uh, say, x in Pn, and y in PM, you have to wonder in what projective space the product might be. And um, there's some trick, which is maybe a little bit of a cheat. Namely, you can you have a, an embedding, so a, a, a map from PN times PM into some much bigger projective space. And uh, if you have x in PN and y in PM, then you define as the product, the image of x times y in this bigger projective space. And then, you know, we just call that the product. And um, we will then see that we also have some universal property and that one can do some things with it. Anyway, we see this next time. Thank you.